Welcome back to Historical Geology. Here I want to talk about fossils and fossilization, and maybe we'll get a little bit into correlation as well. So fossils are prehistoric remains or traces usually preserved in sedimentary rocks. Later on when we talk about sedimentary rocks, I mentioned that sedimentary rocks archives of Earth's history because they preserve fossils. So when we look at fossils, we'll have body fossils, either altered or unaltered, and we'll see what that means in a moment, but we'll see the shells, bones, teeth. You can make out the organism pretty clearly from the fossil. Trace fossils are either uh, trackways, trails, burrows, nests, or even uh, coprolites, which are feces, droppings of, of prehistoric animals. And from the droppings, from the coprolites, we can uh, get some information like diet. In fact, Tyrannosaurus rex coprolites with bone fragments from Triceratops, so we could tell what they were eating. Fossils provide information on ages, depositional environments, and organic evolution. Really, the change of a particular genus or species through time. We see uh, that in the fossil record. Fossils provide relative ages of strata in separate column sections of rocks. So in other words, if we can identify a fossil assemblage, a group of fossils in one area, indicating that they all coexisted in time, and we see that same group of fossils in a different area, even though it may be a totally different type of rock, we know that there are going to be a time equivalent stratum or layer or sequence of rocks. So that's one thing we do with, with correlation. So in this diagram, your book makes a, an important point is here we have two columns of strata. And we can compare, you know, there's some limestones in both of those, maybe some sandstones in both, some conglomerate here. Although I don't, I don't see it over here, but here I see shales. So maybe I could correlate this limestone to this one, but in reality, I could figure out the relative ages in one particular column, but I just don't know how it's related to the other column, to column B, because it's, it's over 200 kilometers away. So uh, this column B could be much younger than column A, or it could be older. So the best way to do that is uh, to use fossils to help me uh, uh, correlate these units. So you can determine the relative ages of individual stratum based on, in this case, superposition, but you can't compare two widely different columns unless you had fossils. So what are some of the favorable conditions for fossils? So remember, we did this earlier. You need to have a hard shell or skeleton. You got to have to be buried quickly, and you have to live in a low oxygen or hypoxic environment. Also, your book mentions that somehow that quick burial will allow the organism to avoid uh, scavenging. Uh, also, the low oxygen will avoid the organism being decayed very rapidly. So there's a better chance of preservation. So really, the three that I'm looking for are these first three here. Good fossils, corals, clams. So obviously, they have shells, right? Brachiopods are another example of, of good fossils. Uh, poor fossils are soft body jellyfish and bats even though they have bones they're they're very delicate and they get broken up um, and since they die land on the ground they're usually scavenged by other animals now here are some body fossils so uh, one of the words that your lab actually uses is, is the word petrification it's a process where uh, the hard parts are turned to stone which really is more of a mineral uh, replacement or a permineralization and you'll see when we talk about this, a permineralization is where, is where different minerals like quartz or calcite, or in some cases even pyrite or hematite, uh, penetrate the pore spaces of the, of the body fossil and, and the original bone material will be dissolved and leaving behind a, a, a permineralized uh, fossil. Uh, the replacement is, well, in this case, a, a, a different mineral moves in there. Um, like pyrite, hematite, or, or calcite, where it replaces the existing minerals from uh, the original bone material. Recrystallization would be an example where there would be like a mineral coarsening or a change in the calcium carbonate. For example, there could be aragonite shells. Aragonite is a form of calcium carbonate, but during the re recrystallization process, that aragonite can change to calcite, which is also uh, calcium carbonate, but in a, in a slightly different form. Both aragonite and calcite are said to be polymorphs. And so here we have some trackways. So that's another a fossil. Again, it's evidence of life in the past. 
and uh, whole body fossils that have that are unaltered. In this case, uh, insects and amber. Uh, so insects and amber preserve the whole body fossil. Mummification or freezing is another one. Here we preserve the whole original body fossil. Uh, so again, looking at these unaltered remains, we have freezing, mummification, preservation of amber, or in some cases, uh, in a tar pit, right? So bones, insects preserve an asphalt-like substance. So really, uh, the tar pits, the, the actual material is called asphalt, asphalt. Now, the other types of body fossils are the ones that are altered. Remember, they, here we have permineralization, recrystallization, and replacement. So remember, the permineralization is addition of minerals in the pore spaces or cavities in the shells or bones. Recrystallization is a change in the crystal structure, right? Going like from an aragonite to calcite. So remember, they're both calcium carbonate, so they're polymorphs, but they're different crystal structures. Replacement is where you completely replace the original chemistry of the bone or shell material and into some other type of material. And then the other one that was I didn't show a picture of is this, this carbonization. And here all the fluids leave the organism and only a carbon film is left behind. So the volatile elements would be like the, like the water vapor or whatever fluids would be in the organism. And you leave behind that carbon film. Uh, and it's most common with insects. You'll see it in fish as well, fish fossils um, and uh, leaves in particular. Trace fossils, we saw some pictures of trackways, burrows, uh, uh, coprolites, nests. And then uh, for molds and casts, remember a mold is the, the cavity with the shape of the bone or shell. The cast is filling that cavity and then having a replica of the original uh, material. So here are some altered remains. So in this case, we have, we have petrified trees. So petrification, or in this case, permineralization, uh, fluids percolate into the pore spaces or the, the, the woody cells of, of the material here and leave a silica material behind. Here we have carbonization, where in this case a palm leaf, or in, over here these are graptolites, they settle onto the seafloor or into, or into lake bed here for the palm, and it's buried, all, all the volatile materials are squeezed out, and it's, this leaves behind this carbon film. And in terms of molds and casts, here the example is we have a seashell that's buried. Uh, the original shell over time dissolves. Fluids get in there, dissolve the calcium carbonate away, leaving a cavity. So this cavity would be the mold. And then later on, secondary material fills in that cavity, and that cavity now uh, produces a cast. So in this case, uh, uh, here's a trilobite. This is the, the mold right in here, and this would be the cast. Here is a mold of a, of a, a gastropod snail, and this would be the cast of it right here. So looking at the principle of fossil successions, also called faunal succession, and we talked about this a little bit in the last video, but the key thing about this one is that there's a systematic appearance and disappearance of species through time. And what that means is that once that organism goes extinct, you will not find it in the fossil record. Extinction is forever. And so using that knowledge, finding fossil assemblages that coexisted in time can be correlated to different rock units. And we get a, a basis for this stratigraphy or the sequence of events. So William Smith was one of the first people to recognize this. He was a, a British canal builder engineer, and his job was, was working with the coal mines and making canals to move that coal to the city. And he wanted to figure out a way where it was easiest to traverse the countryside and get the coal to the city. And on his way, by digging through the hillsides, he would recognize there was a systematic group of fossils that always occurred at a certain uh, horizon. And he could recognize and predict what fossils and even rock, what rock types occurred um, below in, in rock formations below that unit or formations above that unit. So he got pretty, um, pretty good at predicting what rock sequences would occur, and he was a pretty su successful engineer. And then for uh, f these fossil assemblages, remember groups, groups of fossils, so they succeed one another through time at a regular predictable order. And they're useful for this relative dating techniques, as William Smith used. So again, William Smith, uh, uh, English canal builder engineer, and he also was famous for producing the first geologic map 
of a whole country. In this case, he mapped the entire country of Great Britain. And he's considered the father of English geology. Really, uh, uh, his, his a big contribution with his principle of fossil succession. And so in this case, uh, these are just looking at some fossil assemblages, how these are related in time. And by, by finding these fossils in certain rock groups, you can correlate them to similar rock groups that would be of a time equivalent stratigraphy here. So they could be time equivalent units. Now let's look at some stratigraphic terminology. Geologists apply two fundamentally different kinds of units. We look at the lithostratigraphic unit, which is really solely based on rock type, defined by the physical attribute, attribute. And the other one we look at is this time stratigraphic unit or the chronostratigraphic unit. So we use two words for this one here. But this one is really solely related to geologic time. And in this case, we can see we can we can either look at the Devonian system, Silurian system, or the Cambrian system. Looking at this more carefully, there's a couple of people, actually three people we should talk about. Some of the first people who started describing these different time systems or chronostratigraphic units. And the first person we'll talk about here is Adam Sedwick. And he was an English geologist, uh, regarded as, by some as the modern, uh, the founder of modern geology. But he really started looking at rock units that had fossils, although he didn't really describe the fossils. He mostly just described the rock types, or really the, the lithostratigraphic units. But he assigned these units to the Cambrian system. And he was really the first one to, to describe rocks, at least in, in Great Britain, of this Cambrian system. Uh, later on, he looked at rocks together with um, Roderick Murchison. They looked at rocks in Devonshire, also in England, and they named the Devonian period. Um, Sedwick is also instrumental in, in teaching Darwin geology. In fact, Darwin was uh, a geologist before he became a naturalist or biologist. Um, and geology really opened his eyes to this idea of, of uniformitarianism and a long an old earth, a long period, and re he really needed that so that his uh, evolution, organic evolution, could work over long periods of time. Um, Sedwick did not like this theory of organic evolution and really um, uh, was a, not a proponent of that. Now, the other person that's really important is, is Roderick Murchison, and Murchison wasn't really a trained geologist, but he had a keen eye, and, and he really dove deeply into identifying fossils. And the fossils he looked at were these fossils of the Silurian system. And one thing he did do, he described these fossils in detail. He made elaborate drawings and paintings of the fossils to describe um, this Silurian system. Uh, although one of the problems that he later had, he had a falling out with Sedwick, even though he and Sedwick worked on the Devonian together, they had a falling out because Murchison thought his Silurian system went all the way to the base of the Cambrian, whereas Sedwick wanted to include the, the units Murchison studied the Silurian system as part of the Cambrian as well. So it, it, there was a battle. They kind of had a falling out. But it was, wasn't until um, about 1879 where Charles Lapworth came along and really defined this Ordovician system. And the Ordovician system is he, he noticed that there were unique fossils in the Cambrian and then very different ones in the Silurian. And in between that overlap, there were, other, there were unique fossils that you can separate out, and he named the Ordovician system. So those are the first three systems or periods of the Paleozoic era. The older Cambrian, then we have the Ordovician in the middle, and then the Silurian would be the next one. Then after Silurian would be the Devonian system. And both uh, uh, Roderick Murchison and, and um, Sedwick described this Devonian together.